Hey, this is Clocking In, where we clock in with local jobs in Malaysia to get a behind-the-scenes experience on what these jobs are all about. I'm your host, Michelle, and it's time to clock in. Hey guys, today we'll be clocking in with an exotic pet shop owner. Now that's a career that you don't hear of every single day. Essentially, exotic pet shop owners are people who are in the business of buying, selling and in some cases, the breeding of exotic pets. Today we'll be clocking in with Arwin, the owner of Exotic by ARP. Let's go clock in. I'm Arwin Raj. I'm an exotic pet shop owner. I've been doing this for about 10 years and this is my shop. The first thing we do is we check whether they have food, whether they have water and whether they've been clean and also whether they look healthy. So basically we just check whether they look active and then I let my staff know what to do. So we just schedule their work for that day. Well, this is a pastel and cheek clown. It's quite rare. They're considered designer morphs out of this species. Oh, it's beautiful. So the first thing we do, we check uh, that they have clean water. So if it's dirty, we just throw the entire coupling. We just change a new one. This is the cup holder. So we just throw away the paper and we spray disinfectant. We just wipe it just to get rid of the bacteria. Spray a bit more and we put in new paper. So that's the amount of time it takes for you to maintain a snake once a week. So it's quite easy, it's not, it's not that time consuming. Even going through 400 snakes just takes me half a day. Snakes we have to feed nicely, breed them all by ourselves and actually we produce the food then we feed them all. For example, like this snake here, we mark it. So every dot represents two feedings, every two feedings we mark. So that's how we keep track whether they've been fed or not. And also like uh, every week when we feed, we also note what they eat. So this animal did not eat last week so we put a big, a big X there. Usually they don't eat because they are shedding and things like that. If they don't reduce much by weight, then it's usually fine. If there's sudden drastic drop of weight, then there's something wrong with them. Usually that's how we monitor. All these are bred by us. We bred these babies here. When they're young, they take a bit of time to get stable. Once they're stable, once they're eating fine, then they'll just go. No problem with them. For parrots, we have to feed and put water and clean them every day. Their food is pretty common, like vegetables and tortoises, we feed pellets. Beer dragons, we feed insects and veggie. A same procedure, just feed, clean and oh, check their overall health condition. So other reptiles such as tortoise and most lizards, like beer dragons, monitor lizards and everything, they need uh, UVA and UVB lights. It's uh, basically just some uh, mimicking sunlight. So we just check whether the lights are working fine and whether they need to be replaced and things like that. So after you've cleaned it, how do you check on its overall health? So we just uh, visually inspect and it's quite easy to see. There's no stuck shed, the eyes are very clear, he looks healthy, no signs of any health issues. Usually we prevent parasites such as mites and ticks before we bring anything into our collection. So we prevent them from coming into this facility. Once they get into a collection this size, it'll be very hard to get rid. So that is why we make sure we do not bring in any mites or ticks from outside snakes. So these are all uh, bred by us, so there's no issue with this. But even those that we buy, we make sure they don't bring anything in and spread it to the rest of the snakes. What if one of the animals falls sick? They don't really get sick very often. They're very, very hardy animals. Exotic animals are very hardy because they have not been inbred like cats and dogs. Like our purebred cats and dogs, you see how much health issue they have because they've been inbred. It's a very small breeding gene pool, so they're much weaker. The small issue with this industry is there's not really that many specialised vets in Malaysia because uh, we don't have like a proper avian vet, we don't really have a proper reptile vet. But there are vets who are willing to work with these animals. Even if there's any issue with our reptiles, we usually treat them by ourselves. We help our customers treat them also. Is this regular pack practice within the industry for other exotic pet shop owners? Uh, well, a lot of us learn how to treat and how to take care of these animals by experience. There are some pet shops that bring them to those vets, some don't. We have been working with thousands of them every day, day in, day out. So we basically specialise in this, this is what we do. First thing that we recommend our customers to do with advice animals from us, we recommend them to come back to us if there's any problem. We will check the animal and then we will advise them how to progress from there. Let's say if one of your animals or exotic pets were to pass away, how would you bury it or where would you bury it? Because it's not like a domestic pet. First, what we need to do is we need to declare that this animal is dead because they have license, you see. So we need to inform the wildlife department that, okay, let's say you have a licensed animal that passed away. You inform the wildlife department, you go there, you get your license cancelled and then you come back and then you bury them same as a domestic animal. So now it's time for lunch, lunch break. break. 
What is the career progression as an exotic pet shop owner and at each level, what is the pay range for each? First, they learn how to clean the animals, then they learn what to feed. At that point, they start with a very basic salary, 1,200 ringgit or something like that. And then as they progress, then their salary increases and eventually they get projects on their own. Like my staffs that got their own projects. One person handles the rat breeding project. So that person knows everything that's in the rat farm. So that's how it progresses here. And uh, some of them eventually want to go and open their own shop and things like that. I see. Thanks, that's awesome. And now that's all the time we have for lunch break. Is it very common practice in the industry where the animals come in and they are inbred or to inbreed in the industry itself? Things like mammal, we never inbreed them. So we make sure when if we get a pair, we get from different parents, different pairings. But animals like reptiles, especially snakes that we breed a lot, it's okay to inbreed them for a few generations, two to three generations, because there's recessive mutations where you need to get both the parents to carry the same gene. It's quite common to inbreed reptiles. We don't breed them for many generations, like four or five generations, but two or three generations is quite common to be inbred together when, to get certain colors. And there is no health issues or genetic deformities or anything with them. How do you determine how many generations it's been passed down already? Well, we keep track. We have a huge breeding book of record where we code each snake, so we have the total full record of everything. So this is our breeding room. This is where we keep all our adult ball pythons. This is where we breed them and then we hatch them in our incubator and then we bring them out and after they shed, we stabilize them and we sell them from outside there. So what are the challenges in breeding the snakes here? Uh, well, in uh, Malaysia, the problem is it gets very hot. So that's why we need the aircon, that's very important. Once we use aircon, the humidity drops, then we need to make sure the humidity is high enough. We manipulate with the temperature and humidity and everything. So we use air conditioning to mimic their natural cooling season. That's when they breed. Usually we cool down towards the end of the year where it measures our rainy season also. So we cool it down, then we start pairing them and a few months later they start laying eggs. Then we incubate the eggs and we hatch them. Other than that, these animals do very very well in our environment. In uh, Malaysia, we are the largest snake breeders. We have been breeding this for quite a number of years. We actually incubate them like this. So this basically a top is just filled with vermiculite. We leave it alone for 55 days at 89 degrees Fahrenheit, then they hatch fine. Is there a procedure that you go through during hatching day? We sometimes slit the eggs open a bit to help the babies come out. We wait for years. Some of these projects we do for five, six, seven years sometimes. Because it's two to three generations of breeding, that's when we can get the exact thing that we want. Then does that affect the pricing of the snake itself? Oh yeah, actually these animals range anywhere from 100 plus ringgit to tens of thousands of ringgit. So it really matters on what morph they are, what colour they are and how rare they are. So do other exotic pet shop owners breed their pets in, in-house? Compared to 10 years ago, there are more people who are into this now. But generally, retail shops don't breed that much. We have breeders and then we have retail exotic pet shops. There are some that overlaps, but not that many. How do you keep up with their appetite? We have our own rat farm and mice farm where we breed our own feeders. And this is how we breed them. We keep around five to six rats in each tub. So another reason why we breed our own feeders, one is because we, we need very large quantity. There's not many rat farms that can supply this many large quantity. And second is we can make sure that we have a very high quality feeder. So this is how we breed them. These are all maternity tubs. Oh. where they will have uh, baby rats, the mothers can nurse them. This is a water feeding system. We have drums on top, then we have water going through these uh, tubes, and then these are the nipples that they drink water from. This is what we feed them. This is considered a lab pellet. Really? So we just put the food on top, they'll pull and eat the food as they need it. We just put one male to four female ratio in each tub. So once they're pregnant, then we move the mother into a maternity tub. So once the babies are big enough, we separate the mother and the baby, then the cycle just continues. These rats and mice are all for in-house snakes, you don't sell it off? We do sell, because when we sell snakes, we need to provide customers with a food source and everything. Usually, we sell frozen. We euthanize the rats, we pack them nicely in small packets. What is considered an exotic pet in Malaysia? It used to be considered all uh, wild animals were exotic pets, whatever we collect from the wild and keep it. Nowadays, what we consider as exotic pet is whatever that is not a common domestic pets like uh, cats, dogs, goats, cows. So, uncommon animals that we keep as pets are considered exotic pets. Not all the exotic pets requires a license for you to keep. Those animals that are not endangered and not dangerous and not invasive don't fall under the wildlife department. So in Malaysia, wildlife department, which is per Hilitan, is the one that regulates all this licensing and everything for all wildlife animals. Actually, a lot of animals that we keep and we trade need license to work with. And we need to provide customers with the license, with the documents, 
which they need to go and register in the wildlife department. So then where do you draw the line in terms of owning an exotic pet? Most snakes are not venomous. All the snakes that we sell, we handle are not dangerous. They have very small fine teeth like fish. It's not going to hurt even if they bite. So a hamster bite is really painful for me. But I would consider a snake bite nothing. It's not the pain, it's not the danger. It's not danger, it's just fear. That's why we allow people to come, they can handle snakes and things like that. We do educate people, we have exhibitions once a year where we expose people to these animals and things like that. But nowadays it's been improving. There are a lot of wildlife conservationists and people who say that you should not keep wild animals as exotic pets. Where do you stand on it? Uh, the thing is, a lot of these activists that say that we shouldn't keep wild animals as pets do not really understand what's going on. Without uh, captive breeding and petting industry and zoo industries, a lot more animals would be extinct. Because the real problem about animals going extinct is uh, deforestation and uh, destruction of habitat. For example, blue macaws, they are totally extinct in the wild. But there's a lot of pets that have been captive and you know the population is rising now. Without zoos and petting industries, this is not possible already. Man. Because even zoos take supply from petting industries. What are some of the common misconceptions that people have about exotic pet shop owners? They always feel like it's not like a proper job, not like a legit profession. But this is a very big industry, there's a lot of things going on. I think people need to understand more and give it a chance because the younger generation is more interested into animals. Parents always dismiss them by saying that, oh, there's no future in this. They always can walk in here and ask us questions and we don't mind. So thank you so much for allowing us to clock in with you. Um, do you have any last words to say before we go? Come visit us, Exotics by ARP. You can check us on Facebook. You can visit us in Kota Damansara. You can just walk in anytime. We open from 11am to 10pm. The idea of captive breeding really stood out to me because captive bred animals make great pets compared to wild caught animals that just don't adapt well to life in captivity. And when these animals actually bred in captivity, they are not like the wild animals that you pluck you know, from the wild itself in their original habitat. They become quite domesticated. The perception overall in general, I think, has been really, really skewed to think that exotic means dangerous and that's not it at all. I think we need to have more trust in the legal exotic pet shop owners. That's all for me for today. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon for any upcoming notifications. This is Michelle walking out with Sally. Say, say bye Sally. Do you want to come home with me? Okay, let's go home. <laughs>